Stephen Lowe, I'd just like to start by saying welcome to the show. Your book, Overcoming Gravity, was such a great resource for me when I first started. It really put the science programming and progressions into calisthenics when it was in its infancy in the 2010s. We didn't really know much about the science of all this stuff. So I'd just like to say a major thank you from myself and everyone listening has probably looked at your work too. Uh, thank you. I, I'm glad it helps you on your uh, body weight slash calisthenics journey. Uh, definitely, uh, it was definitely a culmination of about 10, 15 years of prior research and experimentation on my part. And it, it was fun to do and I wanted to help people. So I'm, I'm glad it has helped, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people. What are the basic principles of calisthenics you feel that everyone should understand? Yeah, so the basics, um, it all comes down to um, understanding like workout routines uh, are aimed to, you know, specifically improve your abilities in, you know, one specific routine, but then also string them together to generate a positive, you know, training effect in the long run. So you have one that leaves you a little bit more fit than when you started, or a little bit more stronger, a little bit uh, bigger with, you know, your muscles. Then you string together another one and another one, and that's how you make progress in the long run. You get that kind of incremental gains that add up to large effects. That's essentially that fitness versus fatigue model where over time you keep doing something and you're building fitness, but then through nature of your training, the fatigue can often mask that fitness. So that principle comes into play of understanding how to structure your workouts in the long term to make progress? Yeah, the, the dual factor theory, uh, I initially encountered it on uh, the Mad Cows GeoCity website. I, I don't know if you're familiar uh, back in the day, like 2001, maybe 2000. And basically, they explained that uh, when you do a workout in terms of like strength and hypertrophy, you have that uh, stimulus to your muscles and your nervous system to make those gains in strength. So once you do the workout, uh, you've trained your nervous system and you know your muscles to have that stimulus to grow, but also you accumulate a certain amount of fatigue. So most people can notice that it when they you know go to failure in your workouts. If you go to failure in your first set, usually even if you rest you know three, four, five minutes, you're not able to do as many reps in the next set. And so that's an accumulation of usually either neurological fatigue uh, where uh, your neurotransmitters are depleting over time or uh, muscular fatigue where you're gaining the pump in your muscles and you're uh, basically the production of uh, ATP, the, you know, energy uh, holding, holding uh, molecule in your cell is not, uh, you don't have enough of it to, you know, fully complete the reps. Um, so in general, it usually takes um, a certain amount of time in order to recover. Um, for most beginners, that's, you know, about 48 to 72 hours, so two to three days. And that's why uh, full body routines tend to be the best for beginners. With all that being considered, how does that look in a workout itself? If we're looking to optimize from start, middle, end, what does a comprehensive body weight workout look like? Yeah, so there's a bunch of ways to do this. Um, well, I, I tend to prefer full body workouts. And so if you're doing a full body workout, usually the best way to structure that is in terms of grouping muscles together. So like if you have your traditional, you know, bro split of like, uh, you know, buys and back, tries and, ch uh, tries and chest, uh, legs, core, all those different things are uh, hitting specific muscle groups. Um, and I like to term them um, upper body push, upper body pull, legs and core. Those are the, the four main elements to hit basically most of the muscle groups in your body. And obviously there are some like things you can isolate, like um, most of the leg stuff, like, you know, squats, deadlifts, or like pistols or single, single leg squats don't necessarily like, hit your calves. And so you can also add in a little bit of isolation work if you need to hit those areas. But uh, those are the main four I tend to look at for most full, bo full body training. And in terms of the order of that structure within full body, any recommendations? Um, that may mainly depends on your specific goals. And, you know, if you have your main goals as like uh, the planche or say front lever, generally you'd want to put the 
exercise that you want to improve on the most first, um, generally because of that concept of fatigue. You know, the first exercise in your routine, you'll usually be at like 100%, but then the next exercise might be at like 97, 98%, and so on down. Um, you can also order things in terms of um, how fatiguing they are. So uh, if you are adding like barbell training to your bodyweight workouts, like deadlifts, deadlifts pretty much hit all of the muscles in the full whole body. And so if you're doing something like that, um, usually you want to put it towards the end because if you put it towards the front and you fatigue all your muscles early on, then the quality of the rest of your exercises might not be as good. 100%. And knowing what your goals are is super important. The amount of times I've heard people say, I want to work on a planche and then 80% of their workout is focused on tons of volume and intensity on other exercises and they're completely drained with their resources for the goal they think they have, that's an issue. So just in addition to the exercise order, prioritizing your total work towards your goals and being very selective, very important. Yeah, extremely important there, um, especially when, when the fact that you want to aim towards you know sp specific movements that hit your specific exercise um, as well as like, you know, if you had an isometric goal such as your planche or your front lever, then you'd want a specific exercise aims towards that, um, plus also a potential, potential um, dynamic or like full range of motion exercise as well. Now, moving on to, say, a mesocycle, a series of weeks within a workout program, what would be the major principles you'd be looking for to people to apply? Yeah, so a Mesa cycle, for those of you who don't know, is basically a string of several weeks in a row, um, usually going um, around four to eight weeks, sometimes up to 12 um, in terms of, uh, so a single week would be a, a micro cycle and um, stringing those micro cycles together would be a Mesa cycle. And usually from week to week, you're aiming for consistent progress with the exerciser, exercises you're working on. And so with those, um, you're looking more at um, progressing from workout to workout instead of, you know, just the singular workout. Um, so in terms of those, um, generally, you want to have a plan for how you're going to progress your certain exercises. So for like barbell training, it's pretty easy. Generally try to slap more weight on the, the bars or use heavier dumbbells. Um, with body weight, there is a lot of ways to do it. So um, for example, um, you can e increase the reps. So as you increase the reps, of like say pull-ups from five to six to seven to eight. The exercise is getting less intense, but you are doing relatively more work. And as you, you're able to hit usually like 10, 15 reps, then you can go to uh, another progression in say like pull-ups towards one rep chain. So like, um, for example, um, usually pull after pull-ups is something like, you know, wide grip pull-ups where your arms are further out. Um, that decreases the leverage of the exercise and makes it harder. And so uh, you can go to a harder exercise um, if you're able to do like 15 pull-ups and you go to wide grips. Generally, you'll have to go down to, you know, the five, six, seven rep range, um, maybe a bit less. And then um, as you build that up, you can go to another harder progression like archers or um, anything like that, and then eventually build up to the one arm channel. Love it. Now, people that are listening to this enjoy the science, but also can tend to get quite overwhelmed with all the information on the internet. How simple is too simple? How complex is too complex with program design, exercise selection? What's your recommendations for the sweet spot of knowing enough and applying and just making progress? Yeah, so a little bit of what, what, about what I talked before. Um, in, the, in the first edition of Overcoming Gravity, I went over like all the different anatomical motions. So um, like flexion of the shoulder is moving it up forward and then extension slash hyper extension is moving it backwards. Um, I went into those and a lot of people got confused since they didn't necessarily have like an anatomical background or physio physiology knowledge. And so I did simplify it to uh, what I stated before, which is like upper body push, upper body pull. Um, and then um, from those categories, I also broke it into like horizontal and vertical pushing and pulling. And so um, that is, uh, you know, a general gross oversimplification, but it does work for the most part. Um, there are some criticisms of it, but um, let me explain first. So 
Um, for example, uh, horizontal push is like your traditional push-ups or planche exercise where your hands are you know, in front of your body and you're generally horizontal to the ground. Um, vertical pushing would be something like uh, you, know, you have your dips exercise where you're pushing down or your handstand push-ups where you're pushing up. Um, there, there has been some controversy over that. You know, some people like to start beginners with, you know, the handstand push-up progression, where some like to start with the dips. Um, as I explain it, generally, I like to start people with dips until they get to about level four or five, six on the charts, um, namely because most people who are into, you know, bodyweight gymnastics or calisthenics also want to learn handstands. So if they're also practicing handstand as some sort of skill work, you're already getting some overhead uh, strengthening in the shoulders for that. Um, so it, you wouldn't have that overlap with the handstand push-ups and the handstands. Um, also, um, for the pulling in particular, uh, you know, you have your vertical pulls like your um, pull-ups and then also something like inverted pull-ups where you're hanging upside down and uh, pulling up like that. Um, generally, Inverted pull-ups are not necessarily a progression to anything except maybe like an inverted muscle-up, which is, you know, far down the road for most people. So most people just stick with pull-ups, uh, working towards, say, one-arm chin-ups or weighted pull-ups. And then uh, rowing, such as your inverted row progression towards maybe one-arm row or, you know, front levers, front lever row. Understanding that is important for putting your workouts in, in a logical manner, because if you know those categories, as you go from beginner, intermediate to advanced, you essentially just slotting a different progression into that aspect of your workout. Whereas if you didn't understand the difference between a horizontal row and a vertical push, you might be doing way more exercises than necessary for that particular category. But at the same time, there's no need for a person to know exactly what muscles are working, what are the fixators in the exercise and all this other advanced uh, anatomy lingo. So I just recommend people take it as far as they feel comfortable and interested with what they want to learn. And just focusing on the practical stuff, as you said, is what's going to give you the biggest return. Yeah, exactly. You don't necessarily need to you know, overcomplicate things. Um, for the for the most part, uh, for most people, there is a range of amount of sets that is like the most effective. So, like if you look at beginner routines around the the web, like barbells, um, such as like starting strength, you know, strong lifts, uh, gray skull, linear progression, all of them usually have some type of, of amount of sets per muscle group in like about the three to six ish rep range for beginners. And that's more than enough to allow them to progress for strength and hypertrophy. As you get more into like train beginner or intermediate, that's when you see the rep ranges start to creep up because as you, you know, train your body to get stronger and bigger, um, that you need more of a stimulus in order to uh, make that those adaptations to gain more strength and more hypertrophy. So um, as the work capacity goes up, you have that range go up from like the three to six, maybe four to six to uh, four to eight for trained beginners and like six to 10 for intermediates. And then it might not necessarily go up more than that for um, advanced and elite. You just might have to modulate uh, the intensity and volume of the exercises specifically um, after that. Um, but um, yeah, so those ranges are good to think about in terms of understanding that, uh, you know, a beginner is not the same as somebody who's an intermediate and or the same as like an advanced. So that's why, like, if you see, um, you know, pro athletes doing, you know, working out six times a week, you know, three, four hours a day, it, that's not necessarily something you want to do as, you know, like a beginner intermediate. That's way too much. You'll probably injure yourself and get an overuse injury or something worse. If you try to do the things that the pros are doing, you need to start with, you know, the basics and build up your work capacity from there. If you ever wanted to reach that level in the long run. How do we know when we should be doing more sets? Yeah, that, that is a tough question. Um, generally speaking, uh, Renaissance periodization has a great article on their site uh, called uh, the landmarks of I think hypertrophy and basically in that they go through um, the sets 
that are required to um, minimally, well, maintain your abilities. So um, like for beginner, you could probably even progress on like one set of push-ups three times a week. Um, however, you know, as you get more experienced, you know, you might nece necessarily need to go to two to three sets to progress with your push-ups and so on. And so um, there's a maintenance level, um, a minimum effective volume where you start to improve um, on your exercises, then an optimal range, and then like the max range where you make improvements and then past there, usually you're into potential overuse injury territory. So it's kind of like a bell curve if you think about it like that. The the maintenance is where the bottom of the bell curve where you're not making uh, any progress, but you're maintaining your abilities. Um, usually for strength, that's doing a workout maybe like one time a week uh, for one to two sets for most people. Um, but um, going from there to go into the minimum effective volume range, usually you add a couple more sets on that. So like if you're going, you know, two, three times a week uh, for, you know, two, three sets, that's usually enough to hit you in the, the minimum effective volume range where you're making progress. Um, so you can see um, for a beginner with the three to six set range, if you're, uh, you know, like one time a week is maintenance, you're hitting like two to three to minimally improve. Maybe that um, four to five, six range is the maximum improvement you would make. And then more than that, like eight, nine, ten for a beginner might be starting to get towards um, less gains and more maximal recoverable volume. Um, you're able to recover and still progress some, but uh, you're flirting on the edge of going into overuse injury ter territory. So um, that that's a great uh, article to look at if you're interested in learning more about understanding. Um, there's a specifically for hypertrophy, but it really applies to any other attribute like you know, in strength, endurance, um, cardiovascular endurance, all of them have a same similar curve to them where um, if you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced, it's going to be a little bit different in each category. Well said. And I'd also include that using performance as a proxy is very helpful. Just say you've been doing a certain number of sets for a long time and you're plateauing, adding some more sets may be that extra boost you need to gain some performance. Whereas if you've been adding set after set after set and your performance is declining, that might be leaning towards the fact that overtraining might be something that you're experiencing or overreaching at the least. Yeah, you're doing a little bit too much. Um, so generally, yeah, like I mentioned, um, generally it's best to start with like less and try to find the point where you start improving and then you can add more. If you start with, you know, too much, it's hard to tell if you need to, you know, back off a little bit to get optimal progress or add a little bit more, you don't know the specific range you're in. So I'm um, taking that into account. Usually I advise most people start with less and you can always add more. Um, if you start with too much, uh, you, you might be floating with overuse or uh, recovery issues. With workout splits for calisthenics, we touched on full body. I'd also like to go through some of the other popular options. Can you sell full body on me? What are the pros of this as opposed to everything else? Yeah, so the illustration I use in Overcoming Gravity is that, um, you know, strength, the strength equation, which is uh, strength equals uh, the neurological adaptation, so your nervous system's ability to uh, apply force, is multiplied times your muscle cross-sectional area, so um, basically your muscle, how big your muscle is. And that's the strength equation. So you can approach it from two different angles, which is uh, strength training to improve your nervous system and strength training to improve your, your muscles or hypertrophy. Um, so with full body, um, the key to progress is, you know, progressive overload. You, you know, increase your reps, increase your sets over time, and that allows you to progress. And you're aiming to progress with a specific exercise. So like if you jump around to a lot of different exercises, you might not necessarily progress as well because you have less chances to progress with that specific exercise. And if you spread yourself too thin, um, you're not getting enough practice with that movement to improve on it. So um, the reason why I like full body is because you're do usually doing something like three times per week. And um, number wise, that is about, uh, if you say there's about 50 weeks in a year, um, that is about 150 times practice with, you know, push-ups or dips within a year. Whereas if you're doing like a two-day split or even like a, a one day a week hitting your muscle groups with a, a, a bro split or, you know, push-pull legs spread out, 
you're, you may only be getting, you know, one time a week with an exercise. So that's like 50 times practicing an exercise versus like 100 versus 150. You can tell who's generally going to make more progress. Um, it, it's not linear like that. Um, usually it's some type of curve. So like maybe you'll have, you know, 100% with the, the one times a week, but uh, two times a week might be like 170, 180%, um, not the full 200. And then three times might be like, you know, 220 to 250, not the, you know, full three times improvement. Um, so you kind of have a leveling off there. Another advantage of that full body is it's a lot more conducive for auto regulation within a week. You don't always have to do it on the exact days every week. Worst case scenario, you could do two sessions back to back, or you could take an extra rest day in between because you've got, just say you're doing it three times a week. There's that freedom. Whereas if you were doing a push pull legs, you've got to stick to that. If you miss one of those workouts, it's not like you can just replace it on the next day because you've missed that slot. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned the the rest days. That is also one of the huge benefits of full body. You have like dedicated rest days in between each of the workouts. And that's important because you want to recover the fatigue from the previous days, um, not only for allowing the muscles to heal and grow bigger, um, but also your nervous system to recover. And um, we didn't mention connective tissue, but like tendons, um, your joints, your ligaments, they all also need to recover as well. And obviously, if you don't allow them time to recover, you can get uh, tendonitis, tendinopathy, uh, which can set your training back in the long run. How about people that feel full body is just a bit awkward to train? Because I can speak from personal experience it. As you get more advanced, depending on the amount of exercise you do, it's super fatiguing. You've got to go through warm up of upper and lower body. I hear all these benefits. I hear the highlights. I can understand the science of the frequency and it's better for skill acquisition and stuff. But for me personally, I've tried and brute forced it for a few mesocycles. I personally didn't enjoy it so much. Is there anything that I'm doing wrong in terms of I could be making it more enjoyable or more optimal uh, structure wise? Yeah, so usually there's two populations uh, in, that we're discussing in terms of full body not being optimal. Um, some of the ones where, um, such, such as like your age, if you're older, you have less recovery. Um, full body might not be the best for you just because, you know, you can't recover from all the exercises in a single day at once. And so usually if somebody's more of a beginner or an intermediate and they want to implement full body, um, it's actually better to do a full body, but, you know, cut your sets down from, you know, three, four, five range down to two to three, or even like wave the volume. So like maybe you're doing one to two sets one day and doing two to three the next day, then one to two. Um, waving volume allows a, a lighter workout to allow you to, you know, rest more or even just a lighter um, volume in general, if you did like one to two sets of each. Um, generally, I do like that more than trying to split stuff out. Um, because like if you're doing a push pull split, um, which we haven't talked about yet, but um, if you're doing like pushing exercises one day and pulling exercises, then pushing, then pulling all in a week. Um, if you're doing like three sets for exercises there and you have two workouts, then you're getting, you know, six total sets with an exercise in a week. It's actually better to spread it in terms of three times a week, but just do two sets, um, namely because uh, as you work through those, you know, first, second, third set, you usually get more fatigued through each of those sets. And so like, if you can take those third sets and um, put them on a third workout day and have them as one, two, um, you're less fatigued for each of the sets. So you get better practice with the movement uh, with less fatigue and it's uh, more spread out. So you have more rest for that. So that, that would be one scenario, like you're older or maybe you're coming off an injury or something where full body can actually be reduced. Um, not necessarily with like three to five sets for each exercise. You can reduce it to have an effective um, way to do it instead of splitting out. Um, so in your particular case where you're more advanced elite in terms of your strength, um, I do like full body sometimes if you have the recovery, recovery ability. Um, but in most cases, uh, most people who are advanced benefit from splitting out to a, a two days type of split 
um, such as like your upper lower, your push pull, or like straight arm bent arm, just because the exercises are getting exponentially harder. So um, there's a big difference between doing like uh, you know a push up versus holding a planche. One is obviously significantly more fatiguing. Um, similarly, with like barbells, doing a you know 100 pound deadlift is way different than doing a 600, 600 pound deadlift. And so like, if you're getting a very high intensity on your body, you need that extra recovery. So, um, that is why most, you know, Olympic lifting, powerlifting programs generally split things into upper or lower. Um, so like with most powerlifting advanced, uh, concurrent or conjugate uh, periodization, you usually have uh, things split out in specific days for specific lifts. So like you'll have a, a deadlift day a uh, bench press day, a squat day, and maybe like an overhead press day. And you'll have exercises to supplement each of those things on each of those days. And you can kind of tell that, you know, deadlift and squat are lower body exercises and your, you know, bench press and your overhead press are upper body exercises. And obviously you have some pull there. You're not just doing full pressing, um, but um, splitting the days into the splits allows you to accommodate to the fatigue that you're handling with the exercises. Your advice there was absolute gold. I had a small epiphany there with the full body structure because when I reflect back on when I did try it, I was just brute forcing how I would normally do a push pull legs with the amount of volume and intensity into each full body day. And granted, as you said, with the amount of fatigue and stuff, that's just not conducive. I really like that takeaway of having different days of intensity and volume within your full body sessions. Don't just treat them all as the same three times a week. That is fantastic for recoverability. And I also like the point you said before about just being really smart with your volume distribution throughout the week. That's a major takeaway for absolutely everyone because we all know if we do too much in one workout, the downside, we we get that junk volume. If we're doing four sets, four sets, four sets on a handful of exercises. We can't all honestly say that every single fourth set is high quality, good intensity. It just starts to diminish with what we can do. So what I've learned from you there is playing the long game and seeing each of your workouts important in the sense that they contribute throughout a mesocycle. So it's about having high quality work consistently each session. And often that'll feel like less than you can actually do. Because I feel that the standard narrative with fitness is you've got to go hard every single time. You've got to be sore, fatigued. But that only works if you're a beginner because you can't actually produce so much fatigue. So inevitably, you're going to get success no matter what you do. But over time, you've got to be smarter with it and look at how it is session to session, week to week, etc. Yeah, I actually wanted to uh, elaborate more on some like advanced periodization concepts. So. Um, there's uh, a lot of beyond like, you know, progression from workout to workout, uh, which is generally termed, I guess, linear progression by Mark Ripto or wh whoever before him, um, where you can progress from workout to workout by just adding reps or sets or changing, you know, very simple things within a routine. Um, there's also a lot of different types of periodization. And so you have your. Um, traditional like Russian mesocycle would usually be something like a sequential uh, linear program where you're aiming to do like a preparatory phase, um, then a hypertrophy, then a strength, then a power. And that allows you to, you know, build up your strength over time and power to peak for a competition. That is a good one for, you know, intermediate to advanced to elite progress. Um, similarly, there are other uh, methods of periodization such as concurrent and concurrent aims to improve uh, several attributes at once. So usually um, that can be in terms of like, you know, a sport and training or even just like aiming for multiple different attributes such as like strength and hypertrophy or even like strength and endurance. And then you can also have it uh, spread out to different exercises. Like if you're trying to improve a lot of different exercises at once. Um, but uh, the advanced concept I wanted to bring up uh, basically off of that is, um, so there's an advanced version of concurrent training, which is uh, emphasized concurrent. And basically what you do with that is 
um, you have an emphasis on a specific exercise. So, um, for example, um, if your main goal is the planche, then you can actually have shift the amount of sets you're doing on planche to optimally progress. So, um, for example, if you're advanced and you're aiming for like 10 total sets in your workout, you can aim um, about like six, seven, eight of them towards planche specific work. Um, whereas you have a minimum effective volume or even like maintenance volume for your other exercise, like handstand pushups or dips um, down at, you know, like two ex two sets for that specific exercise. So you can have an emphasis on certain exercises in order to progress those. And maybe the other ones will progress slowly, but um, you have, you're able to progress um, those certain exercises uh, the best. And that also flows into the most advanced uh, periodization concept, which is conjugate programming. And in conjugate, um, because the athletes are so advanced in moving um, such heavy weight or doing such neurologically intense exercises, usually you need to put most of the things at maintenance volume. So like um, in terms of that, um, you might have like your planche workouts, you know, two, three times a week, you're aiming for that, but you might have the rest of your training, maybe only two or one times a week, maintaining those specific exercises at like one to two sets, um, just in order to um, have the ability to continue to do the other exercises at maintenance. Um, and then you have most of your volume on planche to make sure it's progressing optimally. So that is another way where you can kind of alternate the volume and intensity of your workouts to really emphasize certain areas of progress while maintaining because you can't necessarily progress on every single exercise at once as you get stronger. It seems as if periodization, when you put it simply, is about fatigue management, resource management, because we've discussed already as you get more advanced, you're generating so much more stress from each of those sessions that you're doing and the accumulation of those sessions, being intelligent with how you wave things or prioritize certain exercises becomes absolutely key. Exactly. And I, I do have an ebook on that. Uh, I got out last year, uh, Overcoming Gary Advanced Programming on my website, if those are interested. Um, about yeah. 100 pages on mostly the different ways to implement all the different types of periodization and especially on the fatigue management aspect of understanding how to implement your workouts. People should check that out if they're more advanced and warrant some of those more specific strategies to overcome plateaus. What about just real basic bare bones linear periodization? Can you talk us through what that looks like? Yeah. So most people, when they're beginning, they can just focus on adding the reps per set, uh, you know, like with your basic exercises or even regressions to those for your like push ups, your dips, um, your pull ups, and your rows. Mainly, you're able to progress from session to session. Um, however, if you do kind of plateau, there are ways to get around that. You can aim to, you know, like add reps one at a time. So, like if you're stuck at three by five, three sets of five. Um, you can go one set, you aim for six reps, and then the next one you aim for two sets of six reps, and then and then finally you build up the last set to six reps. Um, you can add more sets. That usually provides an extra set there to um, allow you to get an act, a little bit more stimulus to progress. Um, there's ways you can change the tempo. So like if you do a longer eccentric um, phase, and you do similar reps, you're actually doing more work because there's more time under tension. Um, that is in particularly longer eccentrics is typically good for hypertrophy as well, since uh, muscle damage is one of the mechanisms of hypertrophy. Um, there's also ways to kind of modify things to get towards like the next progression. And so um, some ways to do that are making the current exercise easier or harder. So you could add like a weighted vest or ankle weights. Those are easy ways to make an exercise harder. If you can't go to the next exercise, there are ways to make the next progression easier, such as using bands or pulleys. Those can easily make the next progression easier. So you're able to do more reps and get in that. And then you can remove the, uh, the pulley or band, decrease those over time. Um, those are really common ways to do things. Um, there's also things like using eccentrics, if you can't do the next uh, progression, 
It's common for pull-ups for people that, you know, jump up and then slowly lower. That is one way to build up from the muscle lowering to getting the isometric to getting the concentric full ability to do the pull-up. Um, other ways are to like hybridize sets. And what that means is if you can only do like one or two of the next progression, um, say Y grip pull-ups, you would do one to two Y grip pull-ups, and then you would do, you know, three, four pull-ups after that to get the harder exercise stimulus, but, but also enough volume with the previous progression in order to have a stimulus to adapt to get stronger and bigger. So, and, you know, as you progress with that, you know, you'd be able to get to two to three Y grips, then three to four, and then you can eventually eliminate the previous progression. So there's a lot of ways. Um, I generally think of it in terms of like intro workout progressions. So those are um, ones or in, sorry, intra exercise progressions. Those are ones where you add like reps and sets of a progression. And then the inter exercise progressions are where you um, start to try to bridge from the easier progression to the next harder progression. Why do we need those two different forms of progression? Uh, mainly because, uh, you know, intra exercise progression where you're increasing the reps, um, fairly straightforward, um, similar to, you know, just having, you know, benching, say, 100 pounds and you know, getting more reps with that. Obviously, you're getting stronger there because you're being able to do more reps. Um, however, there is generally a big jump in difficulty between bodyweight exercises, um, say like the, you know, the tuck planche to advanced tuck to, you know, straddle and then full planche. Uh, obviously, you can kind of make some intermediates there if like, you know, your tuck is like a full tuck like this, and then you move out your legs out just a little bit, and then a little bit more and then a little bit more, you can kind of get a progression there. But it's also harder to track unless you're you know, very good with videoing yourself and then also very body aware where, you know, you know, I need to exactly move out my legs, you know, 10 centimeters or another extra centimeter here. Um, so it's, it can be hard to track with body weight exercises. So generally um, the inter exercise progressions where you can kind of do like those hybrid sets or use eccentrics or um, the bands or pulleys or weighted vests to help to bridge you to the next exercise. Um, those are much easier ways to do it than changing the body position, you know, centimeter by centimeter where it's, you know, really hard to track. Now you've listed a handful of helpful progressions there. Surely we don't have to do them all at once, right? These are all just tools in the toolbox. Yes. Uh, all, all tools. Um, generally you try to progress, use one at a time. And, you know, the reasons for that is you don't want to be overcomplicated and you also don't want to necessarily um, throw too much in a routine that you have to keep track of. Um, so yes. like you can use different exer exercise progressions for different exercises. Like you can use a weighted vest for like dips or like a dip belt to improve your weighted dips. Um, but you can might want to use like a band for your front levers. So you can use different implements here and there for different exercises. Uh, but you would generally only do one thing at a time. You wouldn't use like a band with a weighted vest or you wouldn't try to change a shape and use a band. Yeah. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Fitness FAQs. Become a bodyweight beast with our Cal Snacks workouts. Use the coupon code PODCAST10 at checkout to save 10% off when shopping at fitnessfaqs.com. Don't miss this discount. Start training smarter and enjoy the gains. And, and sticking with this for a mesocycle, you don't do it for one workout and say, oh, this feels awkward. It doesn't work for me. You've got to stick to it for that four, six weeks and then reassess if it's actually made progress or had any meaningful impact. Yeah, exactly. You <laughs> want to make sure you're giving enough time to progress with an exercise. Um, it's common to, as you get, you know, in your to the intermediate and advanced range to not even feel like you're progressing from week to week sometimes. And so um, if you're, and also because you're accumulating fatigue, you might not necessarily know that you're fatigued. Um, you may be making progress, uh, but the fatigue is just masking it. And only when you deload at the end of, you know, four or five, six weeks, that's when all the fatigue will go away and then your new fitness will mask itself. So like one of the examples I used in overcoming gravity advanced programming is like you may over the co course of a meso cycle you know your fitness might improve where you're able to add two to three reps or you know five to ten pounds on an exercise but 
if you're under recovered such that you, you're losing five to 10 pounds or two to three reps of um, the exercise just because, you know, you you can't, te- might not necessarily be able to tell that you're under recovered. And then once you rest and allow that uh, fatigue to dissipate, you'll be able to see those gains pop up after that. And usually the gains are more bigger in the beginning, um, basically. Beginners over a Mesa cycle might be able to, you know, add 20, 25, 30 pounds to their squat or like their weighted dip over, you know, eight to 12 weeks. Um, but intermediates generally won't get those as bi- big gains. You know, if you're able to do that 20, 25 pounds over, uh, you know, like three months, that's a hundred pounds per year. If you're able to do that for 10 years, you know, you're, a world record lifter there. <laughs> so as, as the gains start to decrease as you go up um, over time, because it's kind of logarithmic, you need to um, understand that, you know, fatigue might accumulate more over time just because you're doing harder exercises, but the gains are less. So you have less of a buffer um, between your gains, which may be high at the beginning, but the fatigue is lower. Um, as you get to intermediate, your gains are going to be less and less, but your fatigue might be higher and higher and higher. So the gains might be massed, more massed over time, especially as you progress. And managing those expectations is key because you can't expect to have the same magnitude as you did when you're a beginner or you introduce uh, exercise that you've never trained before. So just having that maturity to be able to understand the time course trajectory of progress based on your level of advancement saves people so much mental anguish and potential injury because they can look at their mesocycle and know what's going to happen at the start, middle and end, and then understand that a deload is an absolute non-negotiable as you get more advanced to mask, to actually regenerate, display your fitness and allow you to super compensate and avoid injuries, which I feel is one of the biggest pitfalls of not realizing your potential experiencing an injury yeah definitely and um you know even if you're a person who likes to do it themselves learn track everything um it's always a good idea to you know read and learn more to understand uh, because there's you know there's definitely a lot of people more smarter than me more advanced in certain areas so even i can learn from other people and if you want you know like a coach if you can pick up a coach here and there to look at your programs to help you, you know, tinker with things to help you progress again, that is always a a good route as well. So, you know, always seek to learn more. um, But if you, you know, you've tried a lot and you can't figure it out, usually hitting up somebody more experienced is really helpful. Even as a starting point before making the investment is just chatting within the Calisthenics community, all these helpful forums on the internet, such as Reddit, you can discuss with people who have been there, done that, or even if you're in a park or something like that, just feel free to have a chat to people. You never know what they can offer or what type of perspective, even if they're not book smart, they might've been doing this for five years and they might understand certain things that the science hasn't had a time to understand in terms of the maybe intricacies of training design for what we do. Yeah, exactly. You can usually learn something from everybody, even if they're less experienced as well. Like even you helping teach uh, a more beginner type person if you're intermediate will help you understand the concepts better and allow you to progress in your own training or modify those uh, better understanding to your own training so there's something to learn from everybody those who are in it longer than you those who are in it shorter than you um, you just have to look for those opportunities so with respect to calisthenics how many goals do you recommend working on at one time Generally speaking, you know, if you're doing a full body or split, uh, generally about one to two at once is optimal. Um, For beginners, you know, if you're doing a full body and you're getting, you know, two push exercises like push ups and dips, generally two goals at the most are applicable for that. Um, And so like you could have your push ups working towards, uh, you know, pseudo planche push ups and planche over the time and, you know, your dips working towards a dip progression or eventually transitioning into like handstand pushups or um, muscle ups. And so, yeah, one, one to two is basically good for most people. Um, if you're an intermediate or advanced and you have the higher work capacity, like doing up to 10 sets, 
you can sometimes get away with three with, you know, like three sets of exercises with three sets, which is nine, which is uh, under your 10 set volume limit. And so uh, you can occasionally go to three, but generally one to two is best for most people. It allows you to also focus in on those specific goals. And that's, oh, that's, oh, sorry about that. that that's per um, like pushing, per pulling, per, per legs and per core or skills as well. Why do you feel most people don't do that? They see calisthenics and they do all of the exercises at once. Uh, I, just, I think they just don't know. Um, they don't know that spreading themselves really thin is basically going to make them progress slower. Um, as, we, as we talked about with like the full body and, you know, you get practice exercises three times a week, um, much like, you know, bro splits and bodybuilding where you're hitting, you know, your chest and tries or your push muscles, you know, one time a week. Uh, they, they don't know that, you know, that's generally probably not optimal for strength and hypertrophy progress. And so, you know, as, as you educate people, they're like, they have that light bulb moment where, you know, the more frequency you can exercise, you can progressive overload it more, you can get towards your goals faster. Um, so you have to have that focus where, you know, you're not doing too few goals, but you know, you're not doing too many. You want kind of want to be in that sweet spot, kind of like the, the bell curve. And it's not as if that effort isn't going to serve you well in the future by doing one to two vertical pushes, one to two vertical pulls, one to two vertical horizontal rows, one to two horizontal pushes. Then by progressing within that domain, then you can substitute other exercises later on within that category. And of course, there'll be the initial learning curve of skill acquisition, CNS strength, etc. The fact that you've worked on those global muscle groups beforehand, those global movement patterns, especially in a closed kinetic chain bodyweight fashion, it's going to transfer over. So if anything, it's the smartest way to go about it because you'll see progress and you can transfer said progress onto something else later on and have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. Yeah, that's the one good thing about bodyweight training. There are exercises that have like a huge amount of transference to other ones. Uh, one arm chin-up progression is one of those also helps with like back, the muscle strength for back lever, front lever, and so on. Same with uh, the pseudo planche push-ups. If you wanted to work one arm pull-up, you could just work towards like the planche push-up progression over time. And generally, most people will be able to do a one arm push-up without even training for it. Yeah, exactly. Why is distraction such a thing? I think people just think working everything at once just gets them to their goals faster. And you know, when when you think about it, it it just doesn't. Or or they have exercise ADHD where like they just want to do tons of different exercises because it's less boring. Um, obviously, there are ways to make things less boring, such as, you know, doing a two day split instead of full body. Full body can be um, very boring for a lot of people, even though it may give the best progress in most circumstances. Um, so like if you do a two day split, you definitely have some more variety and you're still able to progress effectively. Speaking of which, motivation is something that many people doing bodyweight exercises struggle with because it's hard to see it visually what's happening with weights we can see oh we lifted a, a few more kilos or, or pounds depending from where you're from but with body weight stuff it's often like we're doing the same exercise hold for a similar duration motivation people tend to lose it and then they either give up switch goals change exercise like you said because they've they're not seeing the results any advice for motivation with cal snakes um generally i like to not emphasize motivation just because uh, discipline and consistency is more important to long-term progress. Um, but obviously it does play a role. Like if you feel like you're not progressing, then it's going to be very demotivating and you'll want to quit more. And so in those cases, usually um, analyzing your programs and seeing, trying to figure out why a particular program is stalling is a good idea. And if you can't figure it out yourself, you know, get some help. There's obviously experienced coaches. And, uh, you know, if you go to Reddit, I generally look over a lot of people's programs uh, just for free. And so, you know, you, you want to get that help that helps you to break those plateaus. Um, but even if you don't break it, you can always, you know, put something on hold for a while and train something that, you know, gives you a bit more progress. 
Um, I, I didn't really talk about putting things on maintenance, but like you can put an exercise, you know, like if you're stalling on say front lever, you can keep it in your routine, maybe, you know, one to two times a week for a set in the beginning of your workout generally doesn't generate much fatigue, but allows you to maintain the progression that you have. And then, you know, if you're working on, you know, your one arm chin and rows, which generally have good strength transference to the front lever, um, you can kind of switch to those specific exercises to build up more strength. And then when coming back to the front lever in a subsequent Mesa cycle, you'll be able to uh, progress more with it just because you have more of the neurological ad adaptations for strength and usually bigger muscles as well. So um, you, you can kind of put something on hold for a little while just at maintenance and then do other things which have good transference to that exercise and then that can help you break the plateau as well. Um, especially if like the, the simple um, intra exercise and inter exercise progressions aren't working. Um, alternatively, you can always go towards different periodization methods, like I mentioned before, as those will generally to help to break plateaus as well. Um, similarly, um, eccentrics, I like to use to break plateaus. Lots of diff different ways to do it, um, even like changing up the exercise from like a hold to um, a harder variation of the hold with weighted vest or an easier variation of the next progression with the pulley or van will also work so um, you can switch to this you know, stay with the same progression but just modify the way that you're progressing with it. could you explain the concept of leverage as it relates to body weight exercises and intensity yeah so leverage is a basic concept in physics where um, you have a certain amount uh, the center mass of an object is a certain uh, a certain distance from like a fulcrum or um, point at which it there's an angle. So um, the tr traditional example is like a seesaw. If you have a heavier weight on one side than the other, it's going to go one way. So um, in terms of body weight exercises, um, the, the shoulder is our fulcrum for the, the vast, pretty much every exercise. And, and so if you're doing, say, like the planche where you're moving through different progressions, um, a tuck where your body is in, your center mass is, you know, about here, but then as you go to advanced tuck, it moves further away from the shoulders, which would be right here. And then, you know, a straddle, it moves further down and then the straight body, it moves further away. So um, in physics, obviously moving the center mass away from the, the fulcrum point is torque, which is uh, force times distance. And so you have the leverage getting higher and higher over time where you know you have your muscles have to apply more and more force so just changing the body shape in that respect uh, means that you're loading more force on the, your muscles over time um, similarly with uh, adding weight to like the barbells over time it's a similar concept how would people apply this idea of leverage for getting as strong as possible in the classic strength skills in calisthenics be it front levers or planches yeah, so just m working towards the, the progressions over time and working on the exercises that have the most transference, like we were talking about. So working through the progressions, you're making the exercises harder over time with like the tuck, uh, advanced tuck, straddle, um, you know, one leg out and then full uh, planche. And then also working exercises that through full range of motion, which are going to be building strength through the full range, usually also hitting that specific angle. So like if you're doing um, pseudo planche pushups where your hands, instead of pushups where like your hands are underneath your chest, if you're moving your hands further and further down, it is um, basically mimicking the planche hold more specifically over time. And since the angle of the shoulder is moving down as well, um, it's closing down right here, like the planche, you're also getting um, work with that specific movement, especially at the top of the motion if you're uh, leaning very far over. How about with times to hold exercises when we apply that progression of leverages as in choosing how long should we be holding a certain posture before moving on to the next one? Any recommended ranges of hold times? Yeah, so in uh, both editions of Overcoming Gravity, I tried to create uh, the Prilipin table. So uh, the Prilipin chart was initially conceptualized uh, by the, the Rush, Rush 
think he's Russian, but uh, Prylipin was his last name. He probably is Russian if it's strength training, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Prylipin was his last name. And basically, um, he made a table for the Olympic lifts where doing a certain amount of reps at a specific amount of intensity would produce an adaptation to improve your strength and power. And so um, similarly with the hold times in isometric exercises, uh, I realized that some of the most common methods at the time were like the, the 50% uh, method for a minute. Um, so um, basically that for body weight uh, isometric holds like planche, say it, it's 60 total uh, seconds under tension. And so like if you're doing, you could only do a five second hold you would have to do, you know, five times 12, which is 12 sets of five seconds, which is basically a, a cumbersome amount of sets to do for With three to five minutes rest in between. It's a long yeah. workout. <laughs> basically, it's more than an hour of just doing like tuck planche sets. And so I was trying to find the uh, mix of marrying like a- enough sets to progress and a long enough hold time, but not have something be so cumbersomely long as like 12 sets of, you know, three to five minutes of rest between them. Um, so the tables themselves, um, basically it goes off your max hold time. So if your max hold time is, um, say, 15 seconds, um, generally speaking, the ranges that I experimented with but with myself and those I coached, um, the best range tends to be approximately about 67 to maybe 75 percent um maybe maybe even a little bit bigger 60 to 80 percent of your max hold time um so if it was like 67 percent it would be 10 second hold um whereas if it was closer to 75 or 80 percent it would be like 11 to 12 second hold and then um instead of doing you know like you know um probably five six seven sets there like you would for the 50% of 60 seconds uh, range. Traditionally, you would only have to do like about four, maybe five sets at most. So it, in a range where you can definitely do it in a workout, but it's not uh, extremely cumbersome and you're getting an adaptation to improve on that isometric hold. Because this comes back to the principle with body weight exercise, we can't measure our one rep max specifically all the time. So having to work backwards from a intensity range, be it reps or isometric holds, really helps us to understand within a normal training session where we're at with our intensity. And as I said at the start of our conversation, this was the biggest light bulb moment for me and really guided my training for many years with understanding how long to hold an exercise for, um, how many sets to do, uh, what amount of eccentric should I do and what does that reflect in the intensity that we'd expect with traditional weightlifting? If people just leave with one thing today, it's checking out those Prilipin's charts and using that as a reference for your training. Yeah, those are some good ones. I actually modified the um, eccentric uh, prescription in Overcome Gravity second edition. Uh, I moved to like cluster reps of eccentric. So what that means is Um, Say you're doing three sets of three reps Um, for eccentrics. uh, Generally speaking, since you're not necessarily. Oh, cut off for a sec. Uh, Since you're not necessarily, uh, you know, doing a full repetition, your eccentric is basically based on how long you're lowering through the exercise. So like a pull up, you're starting at the top and then lowering through it. Um, Basically, um, you would use anywhere from about three to 10 seconds lowering, um, any more or any less might not produce a, as good of an adaptive, adaptive response, just cause you know, below two seconds, you probably need to do in tons of sets to make up the volume, but above 10 seconds gets more into endurance. Um, so, um, what clusters with those mean is if you're doing uh, three sets of three reps of say five second lowering, you would lower for five seconds, then jump back up lower for five seconds, then jump back up, then lower for five seconds. That's your three reps. And then you rest for your traditional like three minutes or so, and then you jump into your next set. So clustering those repetitions basically mimics uh, the time under tension that you would have had for, you know, isometric holds or 
the amount of time the set the reps for like push-ups takes or pull-ups would take. So with the isometrics, you recommend working within that 67 to 80 ish percent range. What would that reflect hold time wise per set and how many set? Um, so it, it depends on your max hold time. So like if your max hold time was, you know, three seconds, you would do a two second hold. Um, but that also gets cumbersome because like with strength training, if you're doing like a one or two or three rep max, you still would have to do like, you know, six, seven, eight sets to get a stimulus for adaptation to improve your strength. And so I tend to like making most of my clients and athletes stay in about the seven to eight to 15 to 16 second range. I, I think that range, um, at least anecdotally, provides the best benefit uh, for those who are looking to improve. And, you know, if your ability to hold like a tuck planche is only five seconds, you can use one of those methods like bands or pulleys to make it slightly easier. So you can get into that uh, eight, eight to 15, 16 second range and then decrease the band usage over time until you're able to just hold it by yourself. Um, and then if you're trying to progress to like advanced tuck from tuck planche, then, um, you know, if you're doing like the 16 second hold and it's too hard to go to the next progression in the eight second range, you can add a weighted vest to your tuck until you're able to do advanced tuck in the next range. Or you can use a band for the advanced tuck to bring you up to the eight second range and uh, do that. So multiple methods to, to keep you in the specific ranges that tend to be the most ideal. And yeah, it basically helps you to progress a little bit faster, kind of like staying in the, you know, five to 10 rep range for um, strength and hypertrophy for most of your concentric uh, full range of motion exercises. Exactly. It might seem a bit complicated first hearing it, but if you stick within that range for the isometrics, eccentrics, full range of motion exercises, you can apply that to any of the calisthenics movements that you're working on. And when marrying that with a method of periodization that suits your level, be it linear for most people, where they can just continue to add sets, reps, hold time as they progress, that really does simplify and give a lot of confidence with putting the science into body weight strength. Yep. So why don't calisthenics programs designed for strength include a ton of isolation type movements? So with isolation type movements, I, I'm not against them. I, I think they can be really helpful for a lot of people, um, especially those who are coming back from injury or those who know they have a specific weakness. So um, when, I, when I talk about specific weakness, usually you're not a beginner and you're more intermediate advanced. And potentially you notice that, you know, when you're working your progressions towards one arm chin, that, you know, maybe you have trouble with certain ranges with your bicep strength, for example. Um, if your lats and chest and posterior delts are relatively, you know, overdeveloped and your biceps are smaller, then um, adding in specific isolation work can be helpful to uh, help break the plateau that you're on and get progress started again. Um, I, I think a lot of people in doing making body weight programs just don't have the equipment to do isolation exercises or they're not really thinking of it in terms of um, adding isolation to produce a specific benefit. Um, so that's probably the most common reason why most people don't include isolation exercises. Obviously, if you're training for both strength and hypertrophy, um, isolations are pretty great to do as like a finisher for your after your compound exercises in regard to maximizing potential muscle growth in that specific session. And so most people who are hyper doing hypertrophy training are getting those isolations in because, you know, they're emphasizing it. But um, yeah, most people who you know, start off and are making programs um, should potentially consider adding in isolation exercises. Doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, with a dumbbell in particular. I'm sure you have, uh, Daniel, you, you have a bunch of like specific progressions for isolation for like biceps. There's uh, rings, bicep curls, 
and tricep extensions. Um, there's, there are ways to, you know, specifically isolate muscles if they are weak links uh, with body weight exercises and you don't have access to barbells or dumbbells. Yeah, it's not an all or nothing approach. We look at calisthenics and body weight stuff and we simplify it because we're in the culture. We're doing these movements that use our body. And of course, that's going to be the mainstay of what our program consists of. But it's these weak links, missing pieces that don't get directly trained so much with just your compounds. Or it would be very inefficient to just use compounds to achieve the same effect. We know how valuable certain stuff is for the rotator cuff and scapula, given that everything we do pretty much in calisthenics is using the the shoulder girdle. I find that the people that dedicate a bit more of their tail end of their workout to stuff involving external rotation, maybe some lateral raises through full range, have a bit more comprehensive strength and robustness for a lack of a better word. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ring space pulls are also a good one uh, if you don't have access to a machine. Uh, yeah, usually getting some isolation, especially onto like the smaller muscle of the shoulder, like the ro- rotator cuff is a good idea um, in regard to injury prevention as well. Um, usually towards the end of the workout, either the, the gross muscles, you know, like your chest, your lats are fatigued, um, but you know, your, your rotator cuff also fatigues. And so um, if it is a potential weak link, um, if it's fatiguing before you know, you're done with your exercises, then, you know, your shoulder can start to, you know, ride up and hit, hit under your chromium area, which can uh, potentially cause some tendinopathy or shoulder impingement or bursitis. So um, making sure that, you know, the shoulder small muscles have that robustness, like you said, is a, a good idea to not only be stronger, but also help uh, prevent injury. Are we able to use full range of motion exercises to improve isometric moves and vice versa? Yeah, definitely. I actually only did pseudo planche push-ups up to uh, ring style planche. So that was one wow. of my yeah, proud, Respect. proud yes. movements there. Um, but yeah, you, you can definitely use um, your uh, movements to work towards your isometrics, um, in particular, like with pseudo planche push-ups where um, your body is, you're starting in like almost a planching position. Um, I, I like elevating, I don't like my feet on the ground for that. I like elevating the feet exactly the shoulder height. So the top of the movement is exactly the planch lean that you're working. You get that really specific planching work. And even those, you can gear them more towards isometrics. So um, I have an example of a pseudo planch uh, push-ups on my Instagram where I'm doing them, but I'm holding for two seconds at the top of every rep. So in effect, you're getting the movement where you're, you know, working the muscles through full range of motion, you're getting the strength and hypertrophy there, but you're also getting a planche lean at the same time. So you don't necessarily have to add in, um, you know, pseudo planche pushups, planche leans, and then also like, you know, yeah, tuck yeah. planche or straddle planche. You can reduce it to, you know, just your pseudo planche pushups and your isometrics. Best of both worlds, you're not going to be a specialist in holding the isometric because you're not getting the same amount of time under tension in that posture. Granted, you'll still improve because that really adds up after eight reps times three sets. That's a lot of time under tension there. I found this to be an effective strategy for myself in front lever too. I got so bored of doing the isometric holds in horizontal and I really dedicated myself to front lever pulls through full range of motion and using a real dominant eccentric on the way down trying to do like a pseudo pause in the middle, not not fully, but, you know, trying to put effort into that. And I just found through, once again, the sheer number of repetitions, uh, time under tension through the full movement pattern, I was able to hold the front lever for a handful of seconds without specifically drilling that posture. So for the people that want to use calisthenic movements to train through a full range of motion because they enjoy it. They want to get the hypertrophy benefits from going through a full range and getting that full stretch. You'll have confidence knowing that you can still improve your isometric positions too um, for free as a byproduct. Yeah, for free is one of the big uh, concepts that has come out in the, the past years, <laughs> past few years. Yeah. yeah, one thing I wanted to add on to that is um, when you're considering whether you have enough, uh, I guess, 
hypertrophy for the movement, there's often a big uh, misconception in calisthenics where um, you, people think that adding more muscle mass is going to make their body weight to strength ratio go down. And that, that's a huge misconception, uh, namely because if you look at the strongest athletes in pretty much every sport, like gymnastics, you know, wrestling, or even like barbell ones with powerlifting in the weight classes, you'll see that, you know, they're extremely ripped for their, <laughs> they have huge muscles. Relative for the, strength, yeah, pound for pound strength pound. is maximized. Yeah. So um, one good thing that I like in terms of um, understanding the charts uh, and re with regard to what you're training for in your specific mesocycle, like maybe you're only training for strength or maybe you're only training for strength and hypertrophy or maybe only hypertrophy. Um, it's important to understand that um, in the past year, I've generally harped on this a lot, but um, you, if you're within, if you're uh, beyond two to three levels of a movement, then generally you want to be training strength and hypertrophy or even just hypertrophy just because you need the muscle mass because it's that uh, part of that strength component um, of, you know, the strength times neurological adaptations times hypertrophy. Um, so if you're, you're, you know, a few progressions away from it, adding hypertrophy is going to be a huge benefit. Um, whereas if you're in within like about one to two progressions of doing it, you may actually um, be able to just train strength and get to that progression a little bit quicker. And also one understanding that I like in regard to this is um, looking at various physiques. And so like if your physique is very similar to someone who had to um, most of the population who has done the movement, you definitely have enough muscle mass to be able to do the movement. So I like that. yeah, you, you're able to just strength train and get there. But if you're looking at everybody who can do the movement and you know, you're below 50th or 50% percentile, or even like, you know, 25 or 10%, if you're looking oh, extremely yeah. skinny compared to most of the people who can do it, you know, adding hypertrophy is going to be a huge benefit to, to working towards that. It's almost as if form follows function. So just by doing said exercises that suit your goal, you'll build the necessary strength and hypertrophy given nutrition supports that you're in a calorie, you know, at least maintenance to a slight surplus. You'll build the physique necessary to do the movement. It's not as if you need to do five years worth of bodybuilding to get this massive physique, tons of muscle mass to then learn the exercises but yeah, as you said, form follows function. And if you don't look like people that are doing the exercise, be it too skinny or gargantuanly big, then chances are that there might be something to consider there. Yeah. And for, for most people, training for both strength and hypertrophy from the get-go is just the most efficient. Uh, most people aren't coming in from, you know, high level, you know, high school or college athletics where they have the muscle mass from the various sports. And so, you know, adding the muscle mass uh, in, in the long run is going to help substantially, not just training for the strength. Can you talk me through structural balance and why is it important for calisthenics, even if we're not injured? Yeah, so structural balance is kind of a tri tricky topic, namely because in, in recent years, a lot of studies have been coming out that um, imbalances don't necessarily cause injury or cause pain. Um, when looking at the, the research and in the clinic, you definitely see that there is some level of risk if you have like an imbalanced routine or imbalanced muscles. Um, there is some level of risk there. Um, but you like if you're looking at a specific person, you can't actually pinpoint whether they'll have a pain or injury in the future. So, you know, like if, you, if you're looking at somebody in a wheelchair and, you know, they're sl slouched over all the time and, you know, like their body is all twisted you don't know if that person is actually going to have pain or injury in the future. Um, but in our context, um, generally speaking, I like to balance the amount of push and pulls in the routine. Um, so like if you're doing, you know, push-ups and dips, that's two exercises uh, of three sets, say, and you'd want to balance that with your pull exercises of, uh, you know, pull-ups and rows. And so, you know, Push-ups, you're moving the shoulder in deflection, dips, same thing, handstand push-ups, same thing. Whereas with the, the rows, you're moving shoulder backwards, so you're getting the, the posterior delts as opposed to anterior. 
Um, and then pull up, same thing. You're moving the, the posterior delt. So you're getting the, the balance on the shoulder there to kind of maintain things in an equal manner. And just looking at it from a performance perspective helps people to really embrace this concept because rehabbing, prehabbing, not sexy. People <laughs> want to train. They want to get stronger at calisthenics. So I always recommend that look at it as a way to make yourself as performing as optimally as possible. Even if your pushing goals are the predominant ones that you have, balancing it out with pulling doesn't have to be the same extent of volume and intensity, but you've got to do some some work in those muscle groups because you need to think that the body isn't just a simple pushing mechanism. When you do pushing exercises, you're not just using those prime movers such as your chest, triceps, etc. You've got the muscles on the back, the agonists functioning in that exercise too. So by balancing it out with this push to pull ratio, I would argue that people will perform better in whatever goal they have by virtue of a more balanced system overall. Yeah, I'd actually de say it is definite. So um, if you take your one arm chin, for example, if you're doing your one arm chin, um, a lot of people's tricep will actually get sore when doing it for the first time if they haven't developed enough pushing. And that's because the, the long head of the tricep connects to the scapula. So it's being used as a stabilizer during the movement. So if you don't have enough uh, tricep strength there or tricep mass to stabilize yourself when coming through the, the one arm chin, then you'll have to build that up over time and it's gonna delay your progress with the one arm chin. Um, similarly with like the high level calisthenics and gymnastics moves like the Maltese where you're, you know, holding your hands, uh, you know, out to the side and, you know, you're fat parallel with the ground. Um, you're actually using a lot of push and pull muscles at the same time. You know, you're hitting your anterior delts, your chest, but also your lats are on very high tension. There's a lot of strain through your back to maintain your total body uh, tension over that. And so um, building up the push and pull over time is actually going to positively affect the high level skills uh, if you're working towards them. Stephen, where can people find out more about your work? Yeah, so I'm on my website at... Uh, stevenlow.org um, Stephen Lowe as in S-T-V-E-N-L-O-W uh, dot O-R-G um, You can also find me on uh, YouTube at, at Stephen Dash Lowe and on Instagram at Stephen Lowe O-G and then um, I'm also on Reddit as well where I answer questions regarding the training and injuries at reddit.com slash our overcoming gravity. And for those of you who don't have the book, uh, you can get introduced to uh, a lot of the concepts I've talked about today, but also uh, many more concepts in regard to strength training in the book that we didn't talk about. Fantastic. Check it out, everyone. If you enjoyed that, click here for another value-packed fitness FAQs video. Peace.